In 1990, Apple had several high-end Mac models, and also a few entry-level ones. This time, let's restore the machine meant for those who found themselves in between those two extremes. The Macintosh 2SI was launched in October of 1990, alongside two other models, the Mac Classic and LC. This was a push on Apple's part to compete against the increasing number of PC clone systems and an overall downward trend in computer prices. Of the three, the 2SI was the fastest and meant to be the base model in the Macintosh 2 series aimed at businesses and professionals. This particular 2SI came by way of my friend Joel and hadn't had any restoration work done to it. Along the back is a solid selection of ports. ADB, external floppy drive, video, SCSI, two serial ports, audio in and out, and a manual power button. There's also a single expansion card slot, though it's set up in a weird way, which we'll look at a bit later. Normally, brittle plastics are a concern for a machine of this age, but I've found that Mac 2 systems tend to hold up very well. The biggest worry is usually around these case latches, but the plastic here is thick and they don't need to be flexed much to release. And Apple thoughtfully included little protrusions on the bottom case your thumbs can push against. I was relieved to see that the clock or PRAM battery had already been removed, and there were no signs of previous leakage. It also appeared to have received a RAM upgrade and still had its original 80 megabyte hard drive. These machines were designed to be easy to assemble, and the major parts inside just snapped together without needing screws. So I was able to disconnect the cables and just lift the drive out in its bracket. The single fan didn't even have any cables to deal with. It uses spring terminals to contact pads on the motherboard. The power supply has three latches to undo, then it likewise also just lifts away from its connector. Then I could disconnect the floppy drive and release it from the tabs in the bottom case, holding it in place. Getting the motherboard out would push my luck with the plastics, though. It's held in position using tabs on either side that need to be flexed out of the way to allow the board to slide back. It's very common for these to break off in the other Mac models that used them, but I was surprised to find that they gave me no trouble, and I was able to lift the board out. The first thing to tackle, though, was the power supply. These are known to suffer from leaky capacitors, and in vintage Mac circles, it's generally considered a bit of required maintenance to replace them. It's not exactly the easiest task. Removing all the screws is straightforward enough, but freeing the DC connector on the bottom can be rather annoying, as is wrangling the board out of the casing. To keep from making a mess, I cleaned up the thermal paste on this transistor, then stuck on a little flag I made out of some Kapton tape to act as a reminder for myself later on. Almost all of these through-hole caps need to be replaced, so I marked them to make sure I wouldn't miss any. The only exceptions are these two large ones in the middle. Failures of these aren't very common, so I could skip them. Desoldering this many through-hole caps can be tedious, but not too long ago, I picked up a desoldering iron to help with this kind of scenario. I disconnected the AC input jack from the PCB to get it out of the way, then got the first cap desoldered. The iron makes quick and easy work of this, and the old part practically fell out afterwards. Of course, there are plenty of other ways to accomplish this task, and everyone has their own preferences. But having previously struggled with solder suckers and going through ridiculous amounts of desoldering braid, I can tell you that I was very glad I had spent the money on this tool by the time I pulled out the last of the caps. After that, it was just a matter of getting the new parts installed. Something that was another huge help is a guide put together by fellow Mac enthusiast and content creator Bruce from Brankus Creations. 
It shows what caps go where and how many of each kind you'll need. There are guides for other models as well, and I'll include a link in the description if you want to check it out. The first cap I tackled was the most annoying in that it fit in between those two large ones that I didn't need to remove. But with the help of some tweezers and a bit of trial and error, I was able to get it where it needed to be. There were a few other tight spaces as well, but overall, the rest of the caps went in without a problem. What's annoying is that there are two surface mount capacitors in this power supply as well, located on a small daughter board. While none of the through hole parts showed signs of leaking, these two did, and it made installing replacement tandem capacitors trickier, as I had to work around some damage to the solder pads. It's definitely not my best work, but I was hopeful it would be enough. And with that done, I got the power supply reassembled and turned my attention to the motherboard. There are 11 surface mount caps to replace here, and thankfully they're all the same kind. There are two axial caps on the board that I didn't plan to replace because they're also ones that generally just don't fail that often. It's frustrating to see that Apple used tantalum caps in other places. They don't leak like electrolytic ones do, so if these few were tantalum as well, it would have saved a lot of people the hassle. But at the time, no one was thinking that decades later, anyone would even care about these computers, so it is what it is. I prefer to remove surface mount parts using hot air, so I used pieces of aluminum foil and capped on tape to shield plastic components like connectors from the heat. There are multiple ways to dealing with SMD components too, and there is really no right or wrong answer. I've just had the best experience this way. I applied some flux and cleaned up the pads with desoldering braid, then wiped off the residue with an alcohol wipe. It doesn't look like any of the old caps had leaked yet, so there wasn't much in terms of corrosion on the board that I needed to worry about. In the past, I've normally gone with electrolytic caps as replacements to keep a stock appearance, but this time I went with tantalums instead. I applied fresh solder to just one of the pads, slid the cap into place, then soldered down the other side. The little dots of glue left on the board from the original parts sometimes keeps replacements from sitting perfectly straight, but as far as I'm concerned, that's just a cosmetic thing. I double checked my work under the microscope and all of the new solder joints looked good to me. While it shares some of the same architecture as other Mac 2 models, the 2SI's motherboard has some interesting quirks. Most obvious is the presence of a slot for a ROM module. This is a leftover from earlier revisions where it would normally be populated. But this later revision board has two ROM chips soldered in place as a cost-saving measure, after enough time had passed to confirm that there weren't any serious bugs. User-installable firmware updates weren't really a thing back then. With that bit of preventative maintenance done, it was time to reassemble the system. I decided to just drop in the bare minimum of parts for testing. The motherboard, then the power supply. I was pretty confident I hadn't made any mistakes, but since I had done work on the PSU, I decided to do the first power up out in the garage, where it would be less of an issue if the magic smoke got let loose. I plugged in the power, and nothing happened. So far, so good. With the system power on, I pressed the button on the back, and... Nice. Time to test video then. I hooked up a monitor and pulled out a keyboard and mouse. Just because a classic Mac chimes doesn't mean it doesn't have other problems, but in this case, all seemed well so far. The video was clear, the mouse cursor could move, and the machine was looking for a disk to boot from. Let's get the machine reassembled. 
I dropped the floppy drive back in, and while I considered replacing the system fan with something newer, this original Sanyo part is actually pretty high quality, so I decided to keep it. The hard drive, though, was something that needed to go. 80 megabytes was a lot for 1990, but the convenience of a modern flash-based solution is hard to say no to. I got the drive removed from its mounting bracket and disconnected the short SCSI cable, since I'd need to reuse them. I was excited to check out the drive's replacement. It's a new revision of a disk emulator I've grown quite fond of, the Blue SCSI. This is version 2.0, and it builds on the strengths of the original while adding some nice improvements. The biggest change is that it's switched to using a Raspberry Pi Pico as its microcontroller. This isn't to be confused with the main Raspberry Pi single board computers, which have seen supply issues. Rather, the Pico is easily obtainable and on its own, very affordable at just $4 US for the module. The biggest benefit that this provides is improved data transfer speeds. I wouldn't necessarily be able to take full advantage of them with this 2SI, but for computers with faster SCSI buses like the Power Macintosh series, the difference should be noticeable. It also offers better configuration options for use with non-Mac systems and enhanced utilities for working with disk images and transferring files to and from your retro Mac using the SD card. There are several other new features as well, and the pricing is similar to the original, ranging from $30 to $50 US, depending on if you want a DIY kit or a fully assembled unit. I copied a blank hard drive image to a spare SD card and dropped it into the blue SCSI. These are able to be powered by the SCSI bus in most Macs, so hooking up the original drive's power cable shouldn't be necessary. I tucked it into the front of the machine to keep from losing it, but as we'll see in a little bit, I ended up needing it, after all. Since the machine came without a clock battery, I installed a neat adapter called the Meowtos that lets you retrofit a CR2032 coin cell. These are far less prone to leaking over time, so I'm comfortable leaving them in permanently. Then it was time to clean up the exterior. I removed this bit of masking tape that left an unfortunate amount of adhesive residue and wiped down the rest of the case. It had seen a bit of yellowing, but it wasn't severe and actually matched my monitor and keyboard pretty well. So I don't think I'll worry about retrobriding it. The 2SI booted up just fine, but then started behaving a bit strangely. It kept popping up this dialogue saying it had found a disk it couldn't read and asking what to do with it. If I clicked eject, it just came back up repeatedly and sometimes the size changed. I'd heard that sometimes a failing floppy drive can cause weird issues like this, so I disconnected it, but it kept happening. I had booted the machine from my external blue SCSI so I could install the OS and thought that maybe something had gone screwy with its SD card. But then I realized my mistake. I had left a CD image for a much later Mac OS version on there, which was totally incompatible with the 2SI. Removing it was enough to fix that problem, but then I discovered I had another one. The internal blue SCSI wasn't showing up. The power LED stayed dark, even though the jumper to use bus power had been set. I thought perhaps the blue SCSI was dead, so I plugged in a known good one. But it didn't do anything either. I was starting to get worried. Did I screw something up with the recap work? I used the hard drive power cable as a convenient way to access the system voltages and checked them with my multimeter, but they looked within spec. And more confusing was that my external blue SCSI was powered off the SCSI bus and working just fine. As a test, I plugged in an adapter to power the blue SCSI directly, and then it worked. Turns out this is another of the machine's quirks. The 2SI is unique in that unlike many other desktop Macs from the time, it doesn't supply termination power to the internal drive connection, which is conveniently also documented on Bruce's site had I bothered to look it up earlier. Oh well. The 2SI is a bit weird in other ways too. 
Its single expansion card slot couldn't be used as is. You needed to pick up one of two optional adapters first to convert it to either a PDS or new bus interface. They included a math coprocessor, so the computer got a speed boost as well, and third parties made ones that added a second slot to accommodate cash cards. I installed Mac System 7.1 on the internal drive in order to explore one more weird aspect of the machine's hardware design. The 2SI came with a 20 MHz Motorola 68030 processor, and benchmarks confirm it has a reasonable performance increase over the 16 MHz Mac LC. But it's not as big of a difference as it should have been, because the LC came with a 68020 CPU. And interestingly, it's because of the 2SI's RAM. The machine has 1 MB soldered to the motherboard, plus 4 expansion slots. But to reduce costs, the video circuitry shared some of that built-in memory, instead of using dedicated chips. A third-party freeware utility called the 2SI RAM Muncher explains why this is a problem. The CPU and video chip have to take turns accessing that onboard memory, so any parts of the OS or applications loaded into it end up running a lot slower than they should. The RAM Muncher software is deceptively simple. It's a system extension whose only task is to consume that bit of leftover onboard RAM, so all software runs from the add-in modules. Running a utility called Memory Mapper before and after installing it shows it in action. In an era where memory was fairly expensive, this seems like kind of a waste, but the results were compelling. The system overall felt a lot more responsive and to my surprise, benchmarked almost 70 percentage points better, putting it not too far behind the Mac 2CI, which was a much more expensive machine. And the gap could be narrowed further by replacing the CPU clock crystal to overclock the machine to 25 megahertz. Though I'm content to leave well enough alone with this one. At launch, the 2SI sold for about $3,800. A lot, but still quite a bit less than the 5000 or so that 2CIs went for. It sold reasonably well and saw some serious price cuts over time, dropping to 1700 bucks just before its discontinuation in early 1993. It was never the most flashy or impressive computer during its time, but it's one I remember wanting back when it was new. It took a few decades to finally get my hands on a 2SI, but I'm glad I did. Despite its limitations, it's as solid of a machine as I'd hoped it would be.